Hi, my name is Gabriella Carolini, and I'm an Associate Professor of Urban Planning at MIT. Alongside my colleague, Professor Larry Suskind, and our research team here, we hosted a water affordability workshop in May of 2022 to bring together a diverse group of community advocates, federal officials, and water utilities to envision solutions to America's water affordability crisis. In this workshop, we explore the roles of several actors or groups that are critical to household water delivery systems. These include regulators, lawmakers, water providers, which in the U.S. are often called water utilities or water departments within local governments, and of course, water advocacy groups, which include research organizations and community-based organizations. In recognizing this diversity of actors involved in water delivery systems, we hope to raise awareness about water affordability concerns and ensure that they do not remain under the radar of public conversation. The workshop also features research using spatial data, which is one of the key analytical tools water providers and communities can use to understand how household water insecurity is distributed among different neighborhoods. We have found that many households experiencing water shutoffs share specific socioeconomic characteristics, creating neighborhood hotspots. The right kind of spatial analysis can help water providers better understand their customer base and target their outreach and awareness campaigns more effectively. Also, when spatial analyses are publicly accessible, this can help individual households understand that they are not alone. In that way, neighbors can support each other. One of the major goals of the workshop is to enhance water accessibility in U.S. cities. However, we want to make clear that when we speak about urban water accessibility challenges in this workshop, what we mean is that even when physical pipes are able to deliver household drinking water, accessibility can still be at risk because urban households can't afford rising water bills. Water bills themselves can be a subject of confusion, particularly as not all households receive a water bill and thus do not know their water rate or how much they are charged per cubic meter of water consumed. And because water bills may include charges beyond basic drinking water. Indeed, in several cities, water bills are actually consolidated bills that include drinking water charges, sewer charges, stormwater fees, and even in some cases, energy or electricity charges. Equity is another key term discussed in the MIT Water Affordability Workshop. We argue that equity in municipal water services can only really be ensured when there is sufficient clean water at a price that all households can afford, regardless of their ability to pay. However, when water providers do not know who is financially disadvantaged, they can't reach out to provide struggling residents with special assistance. Likewise, when legislators are unaware of the scope or depth of the water affordability challenges facing folks across the country, they can't make policy adjustments or offer subsidies. Finally, when households don't know they are actually eligible to receive support, this creates an awareness challenge. Together, these factors are creating what we call an equity crisis in the household water space in U.S. cities. Liens, and in particular water liens, are one of the most insidious causes of the water affordability challenge. When households cannot pay their water bills, and when they are unaware that there may be financial support to help them pay their bills, a water provider can impose a lien on their property. This is a legal claim on property when a debt is unpaid. Some localities exercise their legal right to place a lien on a property with unpaid water bills. In such cases, the unpaid water debt moves, so to speak, from the accounting books of the local water department to the local finance department, where such liens are managed. Some localities auction off these liens to commercial bill collectors or investors, in which case a household facing an affordability crisis also risks losing their home. Properties can be foreclosed, even sold, if a water bill remains unpaid. CAPS, or Customer Assistance Programs, are the basic source of financial assistance for customers who can't cover their water bills. CAPS vary not only in terms of who is eligible, 
but also in terms of why the water utility is offering financial assistance in the first place. Some are not keyed to annual income, but target elderly homeowners or veterans, regardless of their income. In addition to CAPS, many, but not all, water providers offer households facing affordability challenges a payment plan. These are special arrangements that allow households to pay their outstanding water debts over an agreed period of time. Much like CAPS though, we find that payment plans vary significantly from city to city in terms of who is eligible and in the help they receive working out individual plans. very pleased um, to be here with you all today to gather this group uh, both in person and via Zoom uh, at the Water Affordability Workshop here at MIT. Uh, we are very grateful to our sponsors, the Jameel Water and Food Systems Lab at MIT, as well as the Department of Urban Studies and Planning um, for helping us put together this workshop. Among us, we have utilities, researchers, community advocates, foundations, and policymakers from around the country. Uh, we are all here to share the latest in our own work um, in research, as well as a number of promising initiatives um, aimed at ensuring and advancing water equity in the United States across several cities. We're also here to co-produce and brainstorm together our collective next steps and our best recommendations. Of course, this comes at a very critical time uh, COVID-19 water shutoff moratoria have ended or are ending rather soon. Uh, there is newly available uh, Infrastructure Investment Job Act funds. Uh, but, of course, the question that remains is, now what? Uh, how exactly should funds be directed and distributed? What have we learned in practice? What do we still need to learn? And what can we together say should be done? Over the next one and a half days, we'll feature three different sessions. The first two over the course of today will feature invited speakers discussing the state of research or their research on water affordability. And in the second session, we'll have speakers sharing some of the promising initiatives that are working to achieve improvements in the water affordability space. And the third session tomorrow morning um, will ensure that space and opportunity is there for all of us to essentially share our ideas and our findings. I'd like to invite my colleague Larry to add a few words um, about the work that we envision here. Welcome to uh, everybody who's in the room. Welcome to everybody who's online. Uh, we look forward to uh, talking with you uh, today and tomorrow. Um, I just want to frame the focus for the next couple days uh, as carefully as I can. There's an enormous amount of research on water water management, water quality, um, not just in the U.S., all over. And uh, a lot of that work is being done by our colleagues at MIT and a lot of the uh, organizations represented around the table, the figurative table today, uh, are involved with research on water that goes in a lot of different directions. We are starting with a very specific problem, water affordability in cities. We're trying to analyze what the causes of that problem are and um, how various forces and factors contribute to it, what effects that problem is having on different people, and uh, ultimately uh, we're trying to see if we can have a shared analysis of the source of the problem. Because we're interested in moving from that analysis to possible prescriptions. If that's the problem and that's the cause or the set of causes as we best can understand them, what are some things that can be done to address the problem? We're interested in trying to zoom in on as many points of agreement as we can generate from amongst the larger set of options. Hi, my name is Lydia Cano. I'm a PhD student at the department. I'm Sharon Harlan. I am a professor of health sciences and sociology. I live in Des Moines, Iowa. I'm a retired science teacher. 
Hi, good morning. My name is Alexandra Campbell-Ferrari. I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Water Security and Cooperation. I'm Kim Reed. I'm um, with a Louisville MSD. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer here in Louisville, Kentucky. Good morning, Julie Kennebeck. I'm with Promise Pay. I'm in Market Development and Sales. Interim Water Director for the Ohio Environmental Council based out of Columbus, Ohio. Good morning. I'm Rhonda Johnson from the City of Richmond. Uh, Demar Bias, Oakland County Water Resources. Thank you all for joining us this morning. We're really excited to have this group of folks um, together with us. We, we know that there will be others who will join a little bit later today, particularly those perhaps on the West Coast. this morning is really focusing on the state of research um, from different organizations, including our own here at MIT. We're very interested in advancing research for practice. Um, our team includes myself, Gabriella Carolini, my colleague Larry Suskind, our colleagues Abby Fulham, Jay Maddox, Flavio villas Gricibek, Laura Chen, Emily Fang, and Rithya Renegatan. We like to start with this slide when we talk about our, wor our work to emphasize that we have viewed the problem uh, of water affordability in this country as fundamentally linking utility stresses and household stresses. Of course, all of this has been very much challenged by the COVID-19 pandemic. How did we get here? With the underlying question of exactly who is responsible for getting us out? So at the structural level, we have been looking at both urban utility and household stresses and vulnerabilities across U.S. cities. And at the organizational level, we have looked at customer assistance program design and regulation across U.S. cities. So for over 50 cities, we've looked at physical climate risks, including sea level rise, hurricanes, extreme rainfall, water stress, and heat stress. And so you'll see lots of these radar maps in our next slide here, which have essentially visualized these effects or these climate risks in cities in our sample study. And because of the types of extreme rainfall and water stresses cities across our country are experiencing, it's not particularly surprising that we see separate stormwater charges on the rise. Wastewater bills are, at, are increasing at a higher percentage than water bills in all regions except for the West, which again, perhaps is not so much surprising, but is an indication that the nature of the water bill that folks are receiving at household level is changing and there are aspects of those changes that we need to be paying attention to. There is a legacy of low federal spending on water infrastructure over decades. At this point, we're dealing with the un over 50 billion as an underestimate of what will be needed. Overall, we're looking at, again, pre-COVID estimates of 125% increases in water tariffs needed to meet the 2030 investment requirements. Here we find that there's significant correlation between, for example, um, customer assistance enrollments uh, per single family home accounts in the Chicago area in 2019 with non-white households or the percentage of non-white households per block group. For a very long time, we've been thinking about low-income customers as this behemoth. From a utility standpoint, if we don't have the data on what those households look like, we can't help them with their different energy burdens and their different energy problems. And the data sharing is difficult because of privacy concerns, even within the city. We're starting to open up that relationship so that we can get more granular and figure out who our customers really are. We built a model that we're putting out there open source for utilities. We're working really hard or trying to work really hard <laughs> to create a platform that will allow utilities to do that for free. But the second phase of our research is really going to be moving forward, digging into records, um, legal records, which you'll be much more familiar with, <laughs> of, of tax liens. We tried to educate ourselves about how to go about this by picking one city to start nearby where uh, they use liens, and they sell liens. And uh, we were so startled, you can't even find in the city records what money came in from liens. It's, it's not a line in the, in the budget. Comprehensive financial reports often have this under other 
<laughs> but generational wealth is wonderful, but the generational debt um, that accompanies it is something that, of course, contextually driven knowledge provides that opportunity for you to really focus on that aspect. Thank you. Morning. Well, it's great to be here talking about the American Water Access Survey. So back in 2017, we did a full-scale uh, exclusive study of the state of Maryland on the law of access to water. And so at this time, we used the term accessibility instead of affordability because we saw, first of all, there was no clear idea of what access to water is. And so what happened when there is no definition is that you don't have a compass, you don't have a target. You really don't know what success looks like ultimately. The second conclusion that we had was that the law just was not creating a strong foundation for guaranteeing access to water. That the law is, is intended to create those protections for more vulnerable populations and that in fact it was almost creating additional hardships. Frankly, the law is at the heart of this change and in large part it's at the heart because we write the law. We choose the policies that we adopt as a utility and as a community, so we can change that law and we can rewrite that policy. So the way that we broadly defined access to water was by saying that access to water is having an in-home, reliable availability of sufficient water to meet domestic needs safely. And then we also defined access to sanitation, and that's as having in-home availability of sanitation infrastructure to safely collect and transfer solid and li liquid domestic waste to a treatment facility or to safely collect and treat solid and liquid waste on site. We need to think about those creative forms of on-site sanitation and think about kind of wastewater treatment more broadly by using that term sanitation. And then economic access is this idea that I, as a, household, as a low income household, should be able to retain access to water despite my inability to pay. Ultimately, we are failing our communities and our households if you're not ensuring that everybody, regardless of financial situation, race, gender, culture, ethnicity, um, does not have or has access to water. We're looking at what is allowed, what isn't allowed, and who has what authority to do what. And so I think this diagram helps to to especially show the difference between the concept of affordability and the concept of access and the importance of law as well. What we did is we placed a value. Red is the non-ideal outcome. Green is the ideal or the best case scenario. Orange is kind of, it's okay, but not great. It's better than red. We look at shutoffs and whether or not they've been executed against a household for inability to pay, specifically low-income households. And the metric is either yes or no. So you can see that yes, then that's a problem. No, then that's great. We give the utility the credit for saying, despite the fact that we may have that discretion, we're not going to execute that. Study, we chose to apply this AWAS in six cities. And we looked at Cleveland, Detroit, El Paso, uh, Richmond, Shreveport, and St. Louis. Uh, we partnered with utilities and we asked utilities to complete a survey, which all communities did except for Cleveland. And then we also collaborated with locally based community action agencies and nonprofits to get to the households, actually, actually talk to the households who were being impacted by these water shutoffs and um, by these different fees and, and these policies around affordability and access. So this is the result. And, and largely what I can say here is that it's fairly clear that there's a problem. Um, the laws, and this is the laws written, but as you can see, it's red. And that means that, frankly, the law is providing minimal to no protections for low-income households. You talk about um, whether it's part of the legal or administrative structure of a city to determine where the responsibility moves once a lien is imposed. And I'm wondering whether there's a way to ask the question in your survey the next time around to look at where responsibility sits for those decisions or whether that's just how the city charter functions uh, and it's, there's no discretion. 
what you said is exactly right. The utility is out of the picture very quickly and very early on in the process. And so I think that's also one of the challenges that, at least in the first iteration of this, that by only looking or by only working with the utility, there are certain things that will be missed, especially that side of the story. Are there places where the water system is required to perform a shutoff by state law? Or is it usually up to their discretion? The local law doesn't say explicitly that it, the utility can charge a certain fee. And I think mm-hmm. there's a question on, okay, well, if they haven't told them they can charge that fee, can they charge that fee, um, even if they are? That's a question we'll be looking at a little bit more deeply. If we could aim to clarify collectively what policy options might we all support? If you look at the authorizing legislation, there is no direction. Literally none. It's just money is given to HHS to run this program. No direction in terms of how. Again, we're creating a system where numbers of households are going to fall through the cracks um, because there is no universality to it. Well, thank you so much, Alexandra, again. I'm going to be talking about a project that tries to put some of what we've been talking about into practice and make some changes to affordability policies. And I'm going to be sharing about a project called Preventing Water Shutoffs for Low-Income Households. We are a national nonprofit organization dedicated to creating more sustainable and equitable water systems. We put out this report, Closing the Water Access Gap in the U.S. on the 2 million people that live without access to water and sanitation. We created this initiative in 2020 because we saw that we were in the midst of a moment of crisis and upheaval that was disrupting business as usual in the water sector. The water utility sector's business model is dependent on individuals' ability to pay for services. And the reason that utilities are so dependent on individual rates is because of how we fund water as a country. And shutoffs are the primary tool that are used in response to enforce payment, um, as well as liens and some other practices about 3 million people experience a utility shutoff in an average year. We put together this framework that utilities can follow to make it possible to stop using shutoffs or at least to minimize how much they're used for low-income households. The, The system for funding water services in the U.S. is creating a lot of pressure on everyone and that we need a collective effort to change it. Utilities don't have to solve this problem alone, I think they can work with affordability advocates and with other stakeholders to advocate for more state and federal funding and to change some of the laws to create more of an enabling environment for universal water access. Thank you so much, Zoe. We had questions in the chat. Has there been any thought to kind of treating this as a more like holistic problem of joint water and energy utilities. Like you said, if people are cost burdened by water, they're likely to also be cost burdened by energy. There's been more thinking on that from cities that have a joint water and power utility, which some of the ones that we work with do because they're administering payment for both. Um, So they're able to do things like enroll people in both assistance programs at once. There's definitely a need to think about that at a higher level and to maybe find some approach that cuts through all of the siloed ways that utilities administer their programs and collect payments. Clearly in some states, there's no question that people's heat does not get turned off in the winter. And in those same cities, in those same states, there is no such protection against shutoffs of water. We have laws at California, we have every place that prohibit um, the increase annually. And so I'm, I'm super interested and yet also worried that in, in playing this out, we're not going to see 
this really reaching the folks that we need to reach. But for the question of using a property-based charge versus a tax, I think both are really promising approaches. The charge might be easier to get implemented because it isn't technically a tax. So it might not have to go through the same process to be approved that a tax would. Um, But we're considering that as well, because there's a possibility that it would be considered a tax in some jurisdictions. And that would be something that the utility would have to consider in deciding what approach to take. So the first phase is just looking at homeowners, but we definitely want to understand more about how renters would be affected in the future. In some of these cities, there are people who are shut off for six months before they can get reconnected. And you think about what you have to do to get through that time without running water. And we have heard anecdotes of people cutting back on food or medication um, or even letting another service get shut off in order to keep the water on. So we really need more qualitative research into how people are paying on the same day and then what's happening with people who are shut off for longer periods of time. Those facing the prospect of having their electricity cut off routinely feel anxiety, depression, shame, anger, stress, and other health issues caused by different trade-offs and decisions they have to make day after day. So it's not just the access to water and the health concerns that come from that, but it's the cascading um, health concerns that come from that as well. The stress and anxiety of not knowing whether you'll be able to get reconnected I think there's also the stigma that we put on low-income people in this country and the stress of having to deal with that. That on top of the physical health issues, because we also heard a lot about that, that not only the risk of COVID, but people who have medical devices that need water, people who need access to water for their health, which is pretty much everyone. Yeah, the physical and mental health impacts are significant. Let me turn over the mic, so to speak, to our colleagues at Northeastern uh, University. So I see Sharon and Laura. Yes, hello. So my preface is about um, examining water affordability research in the broader context of water and water problems in the United States. There are a number of different um, groups and stakeholders involved in water, including federally funded scientists and leaders of NGOs and the public. So we know there are different ways to define affordable, but this estimate of 12% holds up in Detroit and Boston's water-rich cities, um, infrastructure and management and governance for problems, and in water-scarce areas in the desert, the front range is um, Denver, then um, it's driven by limited supply. The development of water as a business, the water industry as a business rooted in capitalism rather than in the human right to water has led to the commodification of water and a bureaucratic and politicized approach to providing water. And the sampling frame was carefully designed so that it would represent the demographics of the urban areas that we were focusing on. Black and Hispanic respondents in our survey experienced the greatest median water bill burden, that is their water bill compared to their income, and a greater percentage of them had experienced the shutoff notice. So you can see in these findings that even if a water bill increases as little as $12 a month, it imposes financial burdens on those who can least afford it. People who perceive that their water bill was unimportant, meaning they were having problems paying it, were also more likely to um, have a higher probability of food insecurity, healthcare underutilization, and poorer general health. You know, the cost of household water and 
wastewater services has incre- increased threefold since 1990 and 50% since 2010, which is really striking because typical household water use has declined by as much as 13% between 1978 and 2008. Um, so for people who are in arrears on a water bill, uh, sometimes the municipality will choose to shut off water to the property, or sometimes they will put a lien on the property. Mm-hmm. Utilities shut off water in more than half a million U.S. households in 2016 because of non-payment. Like that this is a th- threatens health, not just for the individuals and the families who live in those properties, but it also has the potential to threaten public health. And we set out to survey just 12 communities in Massachusetts, and we selected just the 12 largest community water systems in the state. We can't expect that we would find a one-size-fits-all approach to um, this kind of a problem. So we really wanted to sort of understand Um, how municipal organizational capacity might condition a city's ability to craft responsive and progressive water policies. So we have, in effect, we have these sort of, you know, sister city uh, comparisons that we can draw now um, across Massachusetts and Pennsylvania. So for both states, the focal city is a high poverty, majority non-white city, Boston and Massachusetts and Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. So our major findings in the pilot study was we found tremendous variation across communities in the design and the eligibility for customer assistance plans. It's a very categorical approach to eligibility. Um, It becomes very, very difficult to understand whether or not the people who most need assistance are actually receiving it. The assistance that is offered is very narrow. Application processes are really often opaque and there's broad potential for bureaucratic discretion. The lack of record keeping in general makes it very difficult to assess the efficacy of these programs or the potential for bias. In our research, we have identified a few evolving best practices in the field. Philadelphia has the targeted assistance plan. Um, We've also seen that some communities are trying to take creative approaches to raising revenue, which might allow them to provide more financial assistance to more people. There is also strong potential for what's known as organizational learning. Utility officials um, we interviewed say that they belong to professional associations. They attend conferences where they could learn more about these best practices. A one-size approach is not going to be reasonable, but communities could learn from uh, similar communities about what has worked elsewhere. And that's kind of the rationale behind our matched city uh, comparative case study design. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Laura and Sharon. That was great. We are starting to see consensus across all of the research presentations. <laughs> uh, what accounts for the emergence of CAP programs? It, in our coding of the interviews, one of the things that we're coding for, for example, is the values that motivate um, a lot of the uh, policies and plans. And we're seeing a real tension in some places between you know, values and narratives around sustainability and the idea that, you know, we should be encouraging people to conserve water. There are provisions in the Massachusetts Constitution that uh, state that people are supposed to have a right to clean water, but it's not really enforceable. It's frustrating that we can't delve into that a little bit more that as, as much as we would have liked to. The law on the books is one thing, but whether or not the utilities are pursuing the law, so to speak, is this discretionary practice. And so to what extent are you capturing that in in the interviews that you've been conducting? My mind runs immediately, of course, to Cambridge, where they said, you know, sure, we've got it on the books, we could do it, we just would never do it, because, you know, we're the People's Republic of Cambridge, and we think it's wrong. (laughs) You know, I would have to delve into the Boston interview a little bit more to think about that. Um, Thanks very much for, for flagging that for me. We're going to be talking about the need for change. We're going to be talking about the need for reform. We need some more confidence in our estimate of the number of shutoffs and who is affected by those shutoffs. I'm concerned about how we shape our ideas together about what the research community advocates next on these issues. I don't think they understand that Liens are also affecting younger people who may still be in their uh, prime of their life. Uh, The lien is going to affect them in a different way. It may lead to them getting evicted from their home. It may lead to family instability. So there are, I think, some assumptions about who's being affected by the liens that don't necessarily correspond to reality. What we do need to know and, and collect data on is the nature of communities, of households that are suffering, that are at risk, And how can we help them? And so let us be very clear in saying saying that the data that we're seeking is not simply um, to put together the chart, but really to understand the nature of the problem so that the policy solutions actually speak to that problem. 
Um, and with that, I, I think maybe we go to the next presentation, um, which starts us off at session two in, in terms of ways forward. <laughs>